Hello, and welcome to Unity Church on the Mountain from my home. The title of the talk today will be The Observer. But before we begin the talk, let's start by preparing our consciousness. Let us affirm together our opening statement. There is only one presence and one power in my life and the universe, God. Let us continue to prepare by taking a deep and holy breath, gently breathing in, holding it for a short period of time and then releasing. And another deep and holy breath, And from this still place, let us affirm together our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And leave us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So you may be wondering, what does a title like The Observer mean? For our spiritual growth and how does that relate to the teachings of Jesus? If you'll look back on our YouTube channel or if you've been following these talks you'll remember I gave a series of three talks about the fundamentals uh, the fundamental spiritual practices. They were love, mindfulness, and surrender. And I think they, that like the 12 faculties of mind or the 12 powers, as Charles Fillmore called them, these three fundamental spiritual practices and the 12 faculties, they all, they operate together. We can talk about them individually, but when we see them at work in our consciousness, they are all acting as one. And the observer is a, a part of our consciousness that is able to see the other parts of our consciousness at work. So let's look at this. To even talk about the observer, we must surrender or let go of our attachment to the idea that we are only one. Okay, and I know we always talk about oneness and that we affirm that we are all one. And that is true. But one of the paradoxes of the spiritual uh, path, and there are many paradoxes, is that even as we are all one, we are all separate. And the same thing goes with our personal, individual consciousness. We are one whole, made up of many parts, in the same way that our body is one whole, made up of many parts. We have within our body many tissues, and each tissue is made up of many individual cells each cell being made up of molecules, many molecules, and molecules made up of atoms. So you see, we are many even as we are one. But there is this illusion that we have, and our culture teaches us this. It's part of our learned, educated personality that we see ourselves as being one united whole. 
that, that, that I am Dean and that I am always the same Dean. But yet, this isn't necessarily in the strictest terms true. Because it's possible for one Dean to make a promise on one day and then another Dean to say on another day, oh, well, we don't need to worry about that. We'll go and do uh, something else, even though this other aspect of Dean, this other aspect of personality has made this promise. There is another personality that is willing to give it up and do something else, or maybe doesn't even remember that the promise was being made. The observer in us is that part of us that is able to go between these personalities and see them in action and note that it takes place. There is a section in the Old Testament. There's a book, the book of Daniel, the prophet Daniel. And in that, that book, there in chapter 7, Daniel tells the story of a dream that he had. And then he interprets that dream. It is my want, my habit, one of the ways that I like to spend time with Scripture is sitting underneath the shade tree in the backyard with my feet, my bare feet, on the ground, and then just reading a spiritual book. And one day I was out there, and I had brought my Bible with me to read. And it occurred to me, well, the book of Daniel was very important to Jesus, and yet I don't know a lot about it. So I just sat down and opened up to the book of Daniel and began reading. And when I came to chapter 7, an idea just popped into my head of what it meant or what it means to our inner growth. And that's really what I'm always looking for when I read the Bible is how is this what I'm this scripture a handbook for my spiritual path? What does it mean for my inner growth? Yes, it is a history. Yes, there are there are proverbs for our, for how to live our life. There are so many different levels to read the scripture. But I'm looking for how it instructs me on my own path, on my own spiritual journey, and that is an in, inner journey. And this idea came to me fully formed, and then I had just to break it down as I reread chapter 7. So the vision is of four beasts coming up out of the sea. The sea being our sum total of our consciousness. The four beasts being aspects of our personality or representatives, because it's certain, at least I can see in my own personality, more than four different voices. But these beasts are each made up of different parts. Like one is, you know, has had a head of a lion and yet they have wings. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open in the Lamsa translation to the book of Daniel now. One of those beasts is the first one is like a lion and had eagle's wings. So you see there, it's not just one part of personality, but there's several parts of personality that have been tied together and represented by a beast. There are a, a group of persona within our personality. And it talks about four of them. Different ones. These four are, the, are different groups of personalities within ourselves, And then there's a one, okay, that, that the fourth one that is very loud, boisterous, and likes to take charge of our consciousness and thinks that it is the ruler of us. But then, in verse 9 of chapter 7, Then I beheld, lo, Thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days did sit. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. 
His throne was like a fiery flame, and its wheels were like burning fire. This ancient of days, I'm going to say, look at this scripture yourself. And don't read it and study it, but read it and put yourself in it. Open yourself to spirit and see how it speaks to you. And it spoke to me as the ancient of days is this observer. But maybe even more than the observer, it's that, that highest part of me, but it's not fully realized yet. The observer in my current understanding, is something that comes out of personality. And so it is an amalgamation of different persona that all have the same goal of realizing what in verse 13 is the Son of Man, that fully Christed self that we all are in our essence. The observer helps to get these beasts in line in preparation for our fully Christed self. And so with the holding that in mind, I'd like to read another scripture from the New Testament. This is from the Gospel of Matthew, and you'll find a similar statement in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy, and each of the, uh, the three synoptic Gospels, they all talk about this same thing. So I'm in verse 22 of the Gospel of Matthew, and I'm going to pull out from chapter 22, verse 37. And Jesus said to him, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and with all your mind. Now, as we look at this verse in relation to the observer, let's think back to the fundamental spiritual practices. Because here we're talking about love in this verse. And, and our love, what we love, is what we give our attention to. We can be sure that the thing that we actually are loving, not the thing we say we are loving, but the actual love that we are giving is where we give our attention. So it says, give your attention to that highest part of yourself with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your might, and with all of your mind. Now, let's think back again to what we just talked about in Daniel. Remember, there were four beasts. With all of your heart. We're reading the book called Loving Yourself to Greater Health on Wednesdays. And we just started the chapter that talks about our body consciousness. How we have, in, in essence, three different minds in our in self. And the one we're talking about in that chapter is our body mind. It involves our endocrine system. It, it, it's part of our, our actual digestion. It's centered in our gut. Yes, there are neurons that communicate back to the brain and the heart from our gut. You know, in common way of saying, we talk about having a gut feeling. Our body is communicating back to our consciousness. Our body is part of that consciousness. If we look at our sum total of consciousness, and in this verse, that is our soul, 
That's that's looking at the definition of soul from the, the ancient Greek perspective of, of soul coming from Aristotle. The sum total of our consciousness. Our heart would be the, our heart consciousness. You've heard me talk a lot about that, that center of consciousness at our heart, which is where we see God. With our mind, that's the one we normally think of as our consciousness but also with our might, which is our body consciousness. So all three of our consciousness are to operate from that highest place that we get when we have our attention on spirit. Now, that is a lofty goal, and we can't get to it if we can't observe ourselves. That is the first step of any of our spiritual practices is our awareness. To the, and the observer in us is that which is aware of our consciousness. So this isn't some magical hocus pocus thing. It's really a part of us. We're not always aware of it, but when we become aware, now we are in the observer. It's, it's really that simple. We can cultivate the strength of the observer by exercising it. Just like any muscle, just like any practice, we, we cultivate it by our practice. All of our spiritual tools depend on first that we have observed something about ourselves. I like to talk about alarm clocks as a way of practicing. But we can also do other things to practice and strengthen the observer. One easy thing that's done is just to observe how we walk. Now, as, as we observe how we walk, we can look at what of these, which of these centers of mind are at work during our walking. An easier example might be driving. Because we learned to walk so long ago, but maybe we remember what it was like when we learned to drive. When we first got in the car with whoever was teaching us, we most certainly were learning to drive from our head, from that mind part of our consciousness. So we can think back and allow the, what the observer to see that we were we were going through the steps, you know, putting the, taking it out of park, putting it in drive or reverse, placing our foot on the throttle. We had to learn, our mind had to learn these steps. And when we first began to practice them, actually doing the task, we were a little clunky and not smooth at it because our head, our mind, was was teaching the body this task. Sometimes it was frustrating and we could see our, our consciousness move from head into the emotions. We might be a little frustrated, angry at whoever was teaching us possibly, or even fearful. Now these are not, this is not the emotional center working at its highest. This is not the heart that's actually centered in the presence. But nonetheless, it is the heart moving into this process of learning how to drive. These centers all, just like the 12 powers, operate from the highest possible level to the lowest possible level as well. Levels being our vibration. You might even think of it as dimension. But eventually, as we practice driving, we go through the steps in our head, we're able to keep our emotions in a calm place, our body begins to learn how to drive. And now, years later, we've been driving a while and we no longer even think about it. We get in the car, we go through the motions, 
and the, and the car actually becomes an extension of our body. We don't even have to think about it. Driving the car is as intuitive as walking. When we first learned how to write, it was difficult. We had to think about each stroke, each motion, but eventually our hand learned how to operate in connection with the head and we just write. So you can see this example. Now if we, if we want to look at our walking, the observer might notice our gait, you know, how is it that we take these steps? What is our consciousness involved in as we're walking? And just the act of observation is going to do a slight shift in our consciousness. It will bring us closer to an, a, a state of presence. It will bring us closer to a state of surrender. So you see how the observer, just by observing, is already renewing our consciousness. And if we want to change our life, we change our consciousness. And that's how love works. We attract into our life what it is that we're holding in our consciousness. And so that's the exercise that I'd, I'd propose that, that or invite you to bring into your life this week. And that is to be ob observant of when you walk. If you're not spending some time walking, then look at any task that you're doing. I, I, I really don't want to challenge you with driving at this point because by, by going into that observation mode, maybe we're not going to drive at our best, but we can look at walking. We're moving a lot slower when we're walking and we're not involved in traffic so much. So we have this safety that we can get from observing our walking. As we're walking, we can look at what is the body doing? How is our consciousness involved in this act of walking? We can be aware of, of the length of our stride. We can be aware of our posture. Are we holding ourselves upright? Are we hunched over? Are we clenched? All of these things come in as we begin to observe our walking. It allows us, by this, to see any habitual things that are going on with our walking. We can, as we become aware of our walking, it's, we're also becoming aware of our consciousness. So we can look at what are the thoughts that I'm holding? What am I loving? What am I giving my attention to? As I'm walking, am I walking with an emotional state? You know, is, am I, if I'm angry in my emotional, in my consciousness right now, as I'm walking, am I expressing that anger in my, in my stride? Am I expressing that anger in my body posture? Is the emotional center doing the job of the body center? is the, the, the thinking center, the mind, with all of its possible clutter of thoughts affecting my walk? Or is my mind calm and centered and my heart still and in that place of spirit and I'm walking upright with a relaxed posture and striding in a natural, easy gait. Am I, or, am I shuffling my feet with my shoulders humped, with my, my consciousness centered on sadness, or my mind cluttered thinking about who knows what that happened in the past or is going to happen in the future, or, by observing this, am I able to move myself back to the present moment, back to the center where I can see God and walk in a harmonious, smooth way? 
It's the observer who begins this process If I'm able to see different voices in my head, I must have this observer. What else would be doing this observation? Exercising the observer allows us to get better at our self-observation. And so that's why the exercise of observing our walking just to practice. I hope this talk has allowed something into your consciousness that was desirable and necessary for your spiritual growth. I am not asking you to believe me. I am only asking you to look within yourself to watch your own consciousness and discover, is this true? Is this something that you can see for yourself? Let us close this session with our prayer for protection. The light of God surrounds us. I am the light. The love of God enfolds us. I am the love. The power of God protects us. I am the power. The presence of God watches over us. I am the presence. Wherever I am, God is. And all is well. Thank you.